belonging neither to East nor West have never advanced with other people. In the March of Enlightenment, the Renaissance passed us by while we remain squatting in our hovels. Tom Stoppard is, well, I mean, there's nothing more to say about Tom Stoppard that hasn't been said. I mean, he's a brilliant, hardworking, lovely man. Uh, truly a lovely person. Uh, you know, at 70, he is full of life and full of artistry as he ever was, I think. I'm one of those who are born for their time. I must sacrifice everything to my sacred purpose until I can say, whatever I want, that's what God wants. Jerry Gutierrez was a very close friend of mine, but he was probably at his best, and he could be a difficult guy, at his best, he was probably one of, if not the best director I've worked with, because he was extremely versatile. And he was very, very useful to us here at Lincoln Center Theater because he could do new plays and the classics and musicals and large forces. And he, he like me, had a great interest and veneration of the old traditional theater which is not to say he was in any way stuffy or old-fashioned, but he valued the words of authors and invested them with all sorts of resonance. I mean, a typical example would be his production of The Heiress, which everyone said, well, that's a nice play, but it's hardly a great piece of writing or this or that. And he so imbued the play with depth and variety and color and everything that it seemed like an extraordinary play. Well, Catherine, you have something to tell me. Yes, I'm engaged to be married. And I am a poor man, Catherine. Oh, Father, will not care about that. The man's a fortune hunter. I care no more for her fortune than, than for the ashes in that grate. Child, you're disinheriting yourself. There he is. He was temperamental. He was very good with actors, unless he hated them, in which case he was awful. He staged well. He was very musical. He had been trained at Juilliard both as a, an actor and as a pianist. So he really had a musical ear. And I don't mean just for music, I mean for speech. When I think of you as a young man, ah. well, New York was full of gilded youths, but you had gold encrusted <laughs> on you. I suppose I was a stage door Johnny, though I never carried a bouquet. No, you sent me roses, hundreds and hundreds of them, dark, deep velvet roses, <laughs> and not a pearl necklace in a carload. And his death was a great loss to the theater and to Lincoln Center Theater. Jack O'Brien is also a formidable director, sort of come into his own quite late in life in a way. I mean, he's directed so much at the Old Globe, which people forget, and he's recently in New York. He's just done everything, and like Jerry Gutierrez, Jack is extremely versatile, directs plays and musicals and classics and new plays. Jack, I would say, is a great, great spirit and a great leader and a great flag waver enthusiast, which someone like Jerry Gutierrez wasn't. Jack is visually impeccable, and he, Jack, and Jerry were both disciples or protégés, assistants of the great uh, director, Ellis Rabb, who was the head of the Phoenix APA, was a real man of the theater, as they say in the French theater, homme du théâtre, which means all-encompassing. He didn't direct that many new plays, but he directed, you know, Shaw and Ibsen and this thing and that thing, and he wrote plays and he acted in plays and, and you know, he knew the cost of every button on the military jacket in Act Two and all that stuff. And to some degree, Jack and Jerry come from that legacy. The thing about Jack O'Brien is that he's so smart that some of what he directs comes too easy to him. And the best things, like many artists, that Jack does are the things that challenge and scare him. And certainly Coast of Utopia was a challenge and 
could would have scared anybody. A country like this will never see the light. We turn our backs to it, and the light is over there, west. There is none there. And Jack, I think, was scared out of his wits from time to time. Well, we all were. But it was just the kind of challenge that his massive mind and extraordinary effervescent spirit could conduct. I've lived on my love for you as in God's world. Without it, I wouldn't exist. I'd have to be born again to have a life. Plain oh. speech, for God's sake. But, you know, by the end of the third play, even Jack O'Brien could, you know, barely stand up straight. These new men spit on everything beautiful or human, past or present. Dan Sullivan is different than Jerry Gutierrez and Jack O'Brien or others like Bart Shear. He's very thoughtful, very meticulous, very serious. I mean, he has a good sense of humor, but he's very moral. If there's a high road to take, Dan Sullivan will take the high road. Very rooted in naturalism and fully finding the truth and the subtext of a, of a play. I mean, it's odd that he's not ever done much Chekhov. Dan Sullivan did, again, with the Sisters Rosenzweig, which was one of several plays that Dan directed of Wendy Wasserstein's. What Dan was able to bring, and here's a very good example of what a director can do, what Dan was able to bring to Wendy Wasserstein was a sense of the deeper and more serious resonance of her plays than perhaps another strictly comedy director would have brought. Sarah, you're my brilliant big sister. When we were growing up, why didn't Daddy tell us about money? <laughs> because girls weren't supposed to know about money. But you became a banker. Because nobody ever called me gorgeous. Dan made you take those plays of hers seriously. Though they were funny. Oh, oh, Jeffrey, so many Jewish American men I know, professionals mostly wear those shirts. Why is that, Merv? It's a money-lending uniform. <laughs> he did Mornings at 7 for us, which was a very, you know, front porch Americana play, which he did beautifully with impeccably kind of limbed, as they say, uh, performances. And Dan is very good at transitions. Dan is not like Jack and Jerry in the sense of he's not, ta-da, here I am. He's not, he's not life, life, life. He doesn't have a sort of elan, if I can use that word. He, he's rather more quiet and meticulous as a director. So you don't, you're not going to give, you know, La Cage Fall to Dan Sullivan to direct. You're not going to give him something that requires almost over-the-topness. Uh, but his strengths are very real and, and very good. <laughs> Bart Shear is his own person, but he's a combination of Gutierrez and Jack and Dan Sullivan. What, what Bart has, if I could reduce it down to two sentences, is he, he's a director who understands the larger world of the play and the small day-to-day -day detail of the play. He understands the metaphor and the reality, the day-to-day goings-on and the larger context. And he knows how to make that theatrical by the work he does with designers and with actors. In my city, the Which is why he's becoming quite an effective opera director. With Joe Turner, his come and gone, he translated the metaphor of the road visually into a sort of more abstract set, but understood that the little dining area, kitchen area of that boarding house was a sanctuary for all those somewhat misfit people. I chose that song because that's what I see most when I was traveling. People walking away and leaving one another. So I take the power of my song and binds them together. Been binding people ever since. That's why they call me Bindle. 
so that with, with Bart you get the larger world outside and its importance within the smaller world inside. And he's one of the few directors that can do that. In fact, I think pretty much the only one I know. Where do I see Lincoln Center Theater 25 years from now? Well, I won't be here, that's for sure. The cautious, worried side of one just hopes that it or theater or nonprofit institutional theater is even around 25 years from now. I think it will be. The optimistic, buoyant side of me or one is that it will not only continue to do a wide range of work, new and old, musical and non-musical, classical and contemporary, in a variety of spaces, as impeccably, if not better than ever before. I mean, I don't see Lincoln Center taking over the world. I don't see Lincoln Center being dubbed the American National Theater. I don't actually believe in that. I don't think it's possible in this country. There are too many good theaters all over this enormous country. Everyone says, oh, there should be a national theater. Well, there are national theaters, but in European countries that are tiny. I think Lincoln Center's pretty good, so that when I think 25 years from now, I will only assume when I'm feeling happy that it will be better. And when I'm feeling unhappy, I'm just assume it'll still be functioning well enough.